No, no, no. The, you made the effort. So uh, let, let me pray uh, for us. Father, thank you for uh, letting us be at Bryan College. Thank you for Thanksgiving uh, week and for just the delight of family and friends and food. And uh, thank you for today and allowing us to look at a really cool thing in the Old Testament. And uh, I pray you help us. Um, would, you, would you bless us? Open our eyes uh, to see your word, ears to hear, our hearts to obey. I pray that we would love you, love other people. And uh, use, would you use this uh, discussion as a means of grace uh, in our lives? And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, so we're looking at eschatology in the Old Testament. That is, what does the Old Testament say about the end of the world? And so this is going to be a really interesting uh, discussion. It's hard to believe that uh, we only have two discussions after uh, today. So don't forget to take uh, quiz 27. You get the points for being here today and sign in, and I'm going to give you double points. Uh, so make sure you take the, the quiz. And as always, I invite you to turn your uh, phone and computers off, and we'll kind of detach so that we can just focus on the text. So what we're going to look at together, we're going to look at eschatology. And if you're not familiar with that word, uh, it comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last. And so eschatology is study of last things. And we're going to look at what the Old Testament has to say about eschatology. We're going to look um, what it says in broad strokes, and then we're going to look at what Daniel says in particular about five coming kingdoms. And then we'll uh, close out our time together by looking at that very difficult passage that talks about 77s are decreed. So let's uh, jump in. Uh, I think we should l uh, work always from the big picture down. That is, what does the Bible certainly say? And establish that first and then work to what uh, we would like to understand. I want to look at some of the hopeful passages from the Old Testament and then looking at the end of the New Testament to see how uh, the New Testament is dealing with those passages. Now, when we start off, right off the bat, uh, Daniel is strange because it's a book that's written in two different languages. Um, the beginning and end of Daniel is written in Hebrew. The middle of Daniel is written in Aramaic. Uh, it would be a little like if you were reading in English a book and somewhere in the middle there were two chapters that were in French. Um, you don't really have to know French to kind of get what's going on. The uh, French and English are very close languages. Aramaic and Hebrew are very close languages. If, if a person knows Hebrew, it only takes a week or two to uh, learn Aramaic. But right in the middle of Daniel, you have uh, uh, these chapters that are written in another language, and uh, there are just smatterings of uh, Aramaic and the rest of the Bible. But right off the bat, let let you know that this is something significant. Uh, there's something interesting going on uh, when the text is. Uh, written in a, another language. This is the first passage, and this, this is written in Aramaic. Uh, Daniel 2, 27 to 35. Uh, Aramaic is the lingua franca of the day. That is, it's the language that if you went anywhere in the uh, inhabited world and spoke, people would understand what you were saying. It's kind of like English is today. You can fly across the world, uh, walk in Tokyo Airport, and uh, you can go up to a counter and you just expect someone to be able to understand English because 
English today is the lingua franca. It's the one uh, language that everyone uh, knows. Aramaic was that language when Daniel wrote. And so this is written in a language where anybody can read it. And this is what the text says. Daniel replied to the king, the mystery that the king is asking about is such that no wise men, astrologers, or magicians or diviners can possibly disclose to the king. Just as a side note here, uh, the word magicians there is the same word um, that appears in the New Testament, the word magi. And these people were being killed because they could not tell the king um, his dream. And 500 years later, you had magi who out of gratefulness to Daniel had converted to true religion and they were looking for the Messiah 500 years later. Uh, boy, talk about impact in the world. Daniel had impact in the world. Uh, and Daniel is not giving credit to himself. He's giving credit to God. Uh, no person like that can possibly disclose it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king to King Nebuchadnezzar, what will happen in times to come. The dream and the visions that you had while you were lying on your bed are as follows. As for you, O king, while you were in your bed, your thoughts turned to future kings. The revealer of mysteries has made known to you what will take place. As for me, this mystery was revealed to me not because I possess more wisdom than any other living person, but so that the king may understand the interpretation and comprehend the thoughts of your own mind. So Daniel is saying, it's not about me, it's about God. But if you're asking, what did you dream? God knows what you uh, dreamt, and here's what it means. And so Daniel says this, you, O king, were watching as a great statue, one of impressive size, an extraordinary brightness was standing before you. Its appearance caused alarm. As for the statue, its head was made of fine gold. Chest and arms were of silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were of iron. Its feet were partly of iron, partly of clay. You were watching as a stone was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its iron and clay feet, breaking them in pieces. Then the iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold were broken in pieces without distinction and became like the chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carries them away. Not a trace of them could be found, but the stone that struck the statue became a large mountain that, quote, filled the entire earth. So this is a dream, a dream about five kingdoms, head, uh, chest, uh, thighs, feet, and then this fifth kingdom that would come and smash uh, the whole thing. So what does that mean? Uh, what is that promise? Well, when we come to Daniel chapter 9, uh, we've got the Daniel 2 passage, but we also have a Daniel 9 passage, and it talks about 490 years, 70 sevens that are decreed. And this is what it says. These two passages are going to uh, be connected, but this is what it says. In the first year of Darius, king, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of uh, Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. What's going on here is Daniel was taken into captivity in about 605 B.C. It was part of the 
first royal deportation. Um, uh, he and his colleagues were taken. Uh, this was about 20 years before the temple was destroyed. They were taken uh, to Babylon. Um, Josephus and others uh, suggest that uh, some of these ones who were deported were made eunuchs. Uh, that is, that they were castrated uh, as young men and then uh, forced to serve in the king's um, temple. We don't know if that happened to Daniel, but many people think that that did happen uh, to Daniel. When he prays this prayer, it's basically 70 years later. And he's starting to think, if the temple is destroyed um, and uh, Jeremiah talked about 70 years, hey, it was about 70 years ago that I was taken into captivity. What does that mean? What does it mean for the temple? And so he starts praying. And if you ever want to know what a powerful prayer in God's mind is, look at this prayer that Daniel prays. This is what he says. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord God, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinance. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us, open shame, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away, and all the countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithful deeds, which they have committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him, uh, nor have we obeyed his voice, the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath which was written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Thus he has confirmed his words, which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us great calamity from under the whole heaven, there has not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds, which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, we have brought up your people out of, uh, you who have brought up your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made a name for yourself as it is to this day. We have sinned. We have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem. <laughs> your holy mountain, for because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications, and for your sake, O Lord, let your face so shine on your desolate sanctuary. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits on our own, but on account of your great compassion. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and take action. 
For your sake, O oh my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. And this is what happens. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision previously, he came to me in extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. Now remember how we've said in this class over and over that all the names in the Bible mean something. Gabriel uh, is related to that uh, idea of God as a warrior. Uh, so this is like the warrior strength of God. The warrior strength of God came about the time of the evening offering. That is about three o'clock in the afternoon. And, he, and three o'clock in the afternoon is probably the anniversary of both God confronting Adam and Eve in their sin. And it's also the future anniversary of when Jesus died on the cross. He came in extreme weariness at the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I've come forth to give you insight and understanding. Now, we might ask the question, where does the word Gabriel appear elsewhere in the Bible? Where does Gabriel appear elsewhere in the Bible? Yeah, he appears to uh, Mary. It's the only place in the Bible that he appears. He appears here, and he appears uh, when Jesus is born two times, uh, one to um, John the Baptist's mother Elizabeth, and one time to the Virgin Mary. Here are the passages. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli uh, Canal, and it called Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So God sends Gabriel uh, the first time to Daniel. The second time is what we just read, uh, just a, a short time later. Gabriel appears two times in the New Testament. The first time is to uh, Elizabeth, um, well, uh, to John the Baptist. Uh, family, um, Gabriel is speaking to uh, Zechariah here, and Gabriel said, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And because Zechariah didn't believe Gabriel, Gabriel struck Zechariah mute for uh, the complete uh, months of Elizabeth's pregnancy. He couldn't say a word. And then Gabriel, about six months later, appears to the Virgin Mary. And he's sent by God to Mary. And he announces the coming of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. If Gabriel only appears these two times in Scripture... Would you suppose these two events are connected? It's the only place he appears. If he only appears two times in Scripture, the default assumption would be that somehow he's starting this 490 years and then somehow Jesus is connected with these 490 years. That would be a pretty good assumption to make. This is what Gabriel says. At the beginning of your supplications, command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Another way to translate that is you are greatly loved. 
Daniel is, is confessing his sin. He's saying we're guilty. We're getting, we got exactly what we deserved. And he pours that out to God. And the first thing that God wants Daniel to know is you're loved by God. God, I'm guilty. I've, we have gotten what we deserved. And God says, I love you. Very first thing Gabriel says. And then Gabriel says this, so give heed to the message and gain understanding to the vision. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the tr transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in the righteousness of forever, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. <clears throat> what do you notice in this slide about the word place? It's in italics. Why is it in italics? It's in italics because it was added by the translators. Here are two different translations of uh, Daniel 9. What do you notice about those two translations when you compare the last sentence? How are those two translations different? To bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and profit, to anoint a most holy place. How does the other translation translate that? To anoint the most holy one. Would you grant that's a pretty big difference in translations? One's anointing a temple and the other is anointing a person the word holy of holies in hebrew is this word kadosh kadashim holy of holies the full phrase um is this and Hannah or Ben if I put you on the spot uh, do you know how do you know how this is translated elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible I'll say it out loud for you and you tell me if it's significant and to, and I'm just going to say it in Hebrew, Mashiach, a Kadosh Kadoshim. Isn't it a fair translation to translate that to Messiah, a Holy of Holies? Okay, now that's a huge difference, isn't it? What is this 490 years talking about? Is this talking about a rebuilt temple? Or is this talking about the coming of a person who would be the temple? That's a huge difference in terms of translation. So... 
here's what it says. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall come and be cut off and have nothing. And um, if you wanted to translate an anointed one, you could translate that Messiah. After 62 weeks, a Messiah will come and be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end will come like a flood. And to the end there shall be wars, desolations are decreed. Another translation, after 62 weeks, an anointed one, a Messiah, will be cut off and have nothing. As for the city and the sanctuary, the people of the coming prince will destroy them. But his end, look at that, that's a pretty big difference in it means the city and the sanctuary. His means the Messiah. It's like, okay, what, what in the world's going on here? He will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured on the one who makes desolate. That is a confusing statement. That's a statement that's difficult to translate. And it's a statement that good people have translated in radically different ways. That tells me that we need to do some work. We need to look at some of these things and see what our options are. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that this is verse 26. And uh, uh, Ben or uh, Hannah or anyone who's had Hebrew, what do you notice about this? Uh, verse in Hebrew with all these like blue little raised letters. What do you know? Uh, do you know what those little blue uh, raised letters are? They're textual variants, uh, which means that even ancient people struggled with this verse. Uh, well. Let's look at the different ways people uh, come to this today. The most common way to interpret it, uh, and uh, this way has been argued um, over and over again, uh, great people committed to God's word, but this is a standard way to interpret it is that the decree to restore and build Jer uh, Jerusalem happened in 445 B.C. Forty-nine years later is when it's completed. After that, 62 weeks, or 434 years, will take takes you to A.D. 30 when Jesus died. At that point, the prophetic clock stops. Then the last seven, so this is 69 sevens from the decree until Jesus died. The clock stops, and then the tribulation will be seven years, and in the middle of those years, something will happen. At the end of the those seven years, that's when Jesus will come back and the eschatological consummation happens. Uh, that, as I understand, is the standard dispensational way to interpret Daniel's 70 weeks. You've got uh, 483 years from the decree 
until Jesus died. Then you have an unstated gap between the 483 years and then the tribulation is seven years uh, and will end with Jesus coming back. That's the standard way that much of the Christian world uh, interprets the prophecy. And you can see this is a beautiful um, um, graphic. I got it from swordsearcher.com. And related to that then is the vision of chapter 2 where you've got um, Nebuchadnezzar, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, the Roman, and then sometime in the future, you're going to have a reestablished Roman Empire, uh, and it will be in that reestablished Roman Empire when Jesus comes back. That's a standard dispensational way of interpreting this passage. And you can see that uh, this is a, another, I got all these uh, uh, images off the internet, and you can see there you've got the gap, uh, the Messiah is cut off and had nothing. And then you have the final week of seven years of the tribulation. Uh, same here. Uh, you've got the decree in 445. Uh, this uh, dates it at 32. Uh, you have an unstated gap. And then the seven weeks of uh, the seven years of the tribulation. And um, a variation of that view would be uh, pre-wrath uh, rapture, uh, and then Christ comes back. Standard way to interpret. It's not the only way that this has been interpreted, though. The other way it's interpreted is uh, this way. You've got kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greek, and then the Roman kingdom uh, transitions from uh, the democracy to um, a dictatorship. And then that period ends in 30 AD. People who follow that view will date the decree from 456 uh, BC. And it ends the 483 uh, ends with the start of Jesus' public ministry. Halfway through that, three and a half years later, Jesus dies on the cross. Uh, this chart dates it, and I got all of these off the internet, but uh, this one goes uh, 31. I think most people who follow this chart date it at 30. You don't count year zero, so you, you're losing a year. And then three and a half years later, Stephen is stoned. And when Stephen is stoned, the gospel goes out to all the nations of the world. And God begins building a temple out of people, out of the nations. So Daniel is saying, well, what about the temple? And God's saying, look, 490 years Later, the physical temple isn't going to matter anymore because God's going to build his temple out of people. Now, if you take that view, then those seven years don't refer to the tribulation. Uh, another, this is from E Hope for All. And notice they're doing it the same way, uh, 457. A lot of people do this 456, I think, and 31. Start of Jesus' ministry, he's cut off and has nothing. And then here the gospel goes forward to the Gentiles. Uh, this is uh, another chart uh, doing the 7, 7, 62, 7s in the final seven, uh, similar one uh, ending in 34. So can you see how your decision on this is a pretty big deal? Um, 
how you're interpreting these feet of iron and clay is a pretty big deal. And how you interpret the rock is a pretty big deal. Uh, that's why they called the, many of the Puritans fifth monarchy men. Um, they believed that Jesus was establishing a kingdom, a kingdom that would fill the earth uh, and subdue it. All of that centers around how you interpret Daniel 2's relationship to Daniel 9. When do the uh, 70 years start? All of these have been forwarded. Uh, the two most popular, I think, uh, this, this will be the standard dispensational uh, this would be the standard non-dispensational way uh, to do it. I uh, have come down on this side, but I hold it with an open hand. This, uh, we're going to see the translation of these verses is difficult. Um, there are places where you're having to make decisions as a translator, uh, we've seen one with this whole holy of holies as a place versus a person. Uh, good men, good women have differed on this. Uh, if you ask what what do I think, I, I signed with the non-dispensational view, but I hold it with an open hand um, because I recognize that no matter what view you take, um, there are going to be problems with that view. But my eschatology is kind of a happy eschatology. Uh, uh, and someone would say, well, why do you take that view? Well, I'll show you the passages and you, and you tell me uh, what you think. What's the very first command given in the Bible? A very first command in the Bible given to people. What is it? It's this one. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, and over everything that creeps on the ground. Do you see that that's a five-fold command? Well, in the text, that's actually later, right? That doesn't occur till chapter 2, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's kind of a weird thing there, isn't it? Because this is given before the description of Adam and Eve, and it's like, how do you bring these two together? Uh, um they are related, but this is the actual first commandment that's given to people um, from God. It's a command to fill the earth. Now, here's my question. Is that command given to the man or is it given to the man and the woman? You can kind of see it in English. In Hebrew, it's crystal clear whether it's to the man or to the man and the woman. Which is it? It's the man and the woman. God blessed them. God said to them. And in Hebrew, it's clear because these are all plural imperatives. Uh, you all fill the earth. You all uh, uh, rada it. Uh, you all um, put the kibosh on it. Uh, in, in Hebrew, this command is given to the man and his wife. 
did they fulfill this command? Did they rule over all the things that creep on the ground? Or did they get owned by the creeper? They, they got owned. They got ruled over. They were made, and you as the image of God are made to rule. You're not going to be happy until you're exercising this godlike uh, dominion over creation because that's who you were created. That's who you were created to be. You're not going to be happy until that's true of you. Adam and Eve didn't feel, fulfill this. Did Jesus come as the new Adam? Did he come to fulfill everything that the first Adam got wrong? So would you expect or would you not expect that that dominion that he will exercise ultimately over the, cre the creepiest creep of them all, would you think that would include or exclude his wife? I would think it would include his wife. I think the two of them are going to be fruitful. I mean, what's God's first plan for evangelism? It's for two God lovers to come together and make other God lovers, right? That's, that's kind of what he desires to happen. I would expect Christ and his bride to be fruitful. I would expect uh, those God lovers to multiply. I would expect them to fill the earth. I would expect them to rada it. I would expect them to put the kibosh on everything, including the things that creep on the ground. My eschatology comes from Genesis 1 because I think Jesus came to fulfill all that the first Adam failed to fulfill. And if the command is to the man and his woman, I think the ultimate fulfillment of that will be by Christ and his new Eve. Now, I could be wrong about that. Uh, I think everyone who's ever come to any of these texts is... Uh, trying to do the same thing. I, I don't think one side is immoral or anything like that. I think it's a difficult text and we're trying to put the pieces together. This is the way that I find most persuasive in terms of the piece, pieces being put together. I expect Christ's wife to participate in the conquering of all enemies. That's why I believe the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters fill the sea. Psalm 2 says, Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. Are there places on earth now where it's illegal to proclaim the name of Jesus? As I read this promise, the day will come when the ends of the earth will be the possession of Jesus. Which I makes me believe that there's going to be a massive revival and there will be a conversion. You will rule over them with the iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. I think Jesus did that when he died on the cross and he dashed our fallen natures and began to bring his redemption to the world. Psalm 110.1, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Well, what counts as an enemy of Christ today, would you say? Is it an enemy of Christ 
that not 150 miles from here, there are young girls who are being sexually trafficked in Atlanta. Is that an enemy of Christ, would you think? Uh, is it an enemy of Christ that there were more young girls sexually trafficked uh, during last year's Super Bowl than ever before anywhere else? And that's 150, 150 miles uh, from right here. Is that an enemy of Christ? Did God the Father promise to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Is it an enemy of Christ that in certain places in the Middle East you can't proclaim the name of Jesus without being killed? Is that an enemy of Christ? Is it an enemy of Christ that children are being starved to death? Is it an enemy of Christ that there are 30 million AIDS orphans in Africa? Is it an enemy of Christ that you cannot turn on the TV without hearing Christ and Christianity mocked? I think the text says that God has promised that the enemies will be made a footstool. It says you will rule in the midst of your enemies. And if I'd had time, I would have have put the Hebrew up, but the Hebrew word here, uh, rule, is the word rada. And guess where rada first appears? Well, you guessed it, didn't it? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rada it. Psalm 110 is saying, you will rada in the midst of your enemies. It's interesting that when Paul alludes to that passage in 1 Corinthians 15.25, he adds one word. And notice what word he adds. He adds the word all. He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Habakkuk 2.14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. How will it be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God? As the waters cover the sea. Have you ever flown an airplane across the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean? Have you ever done that? That's the most boring thing in the world, isn't it? If you do it in the daytime, uh, you look out and what do you see uh, when you fly over the ocean? <laughs> you see water for an hour, for two hours, for three hours, for four hours. You see water until you think you're going to go mad. How do the waters cover the sea? You ever fly over the sea and like big... See a big hole where there's no water? Yeah, me either. Because waters completely cover the sea. And this verse is saying the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the... And someone says, oh, oh, oh wait, wait a second. Uh, the waters only cover seven-eighths of the world's surface. So you can't use this to say... Uh, the earth is going to be completely Christian. Okay, okay. I'll settle for seven-eighths of the seven billion people who live on the earth. Whatever this is talking about, this is talking about a massive uh, connection between the entire earth and the people of God. Isaiah 9, 7, there will be no end to the increase of his kingdom. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish, to uphold it, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. 
Genesis 22, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, as the sand which is on the seashore. Do you know how many grains of sand there are on planet Earth? There are trillions of grains of sand on the planet Earth. God promised Abraham, that's what your offspring is going to be like. Trillions of people. I don't know. That sounds like a pretty massive revival to me. And then God says, your seed shall possess the gate of their enemy. Once you fight your way and seize the gate, the battle's over. <clears throat> Is it an enemy of Christ today that, what is it, um, 11 out of 12 of Ivy League schools were founded as conservative Christian uh, institutions, and now every one of them has expelled every conservative uh, Christian voice? Is it an enemy of Christ that ancient uh, universities like Oxford and Cambridge have plastered all over the uh, walls uh, statements to the glory of God, and yet uh, that conservative expression of Christianity has been expelled from those places today? Is that an enemy? As, as I'm reading these texts, this is saying that Jesus is going to possess the gate of his enemies, that there isn't anywhere... Uh, so, so often we picture the kingdom of God when it says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We picture that it's it's Christianity that's being besieged and, and those doors are going to keep uh, Satan out. That's the wrong image. It isn't Christianity being besieged. It's hell that's being besieged. And it's saying those gates aren't going to be strong enough to resist the power of Christ and his kingdom. So when I compare the two Adams, I see that one was given the command, be fruitful, and he failed. And I see Jesus comes as the second Adam to fix everything the first Adam got wrong. I see that command is given to the man and his wife, and so I expect that the command would be fulfilled by the man and his wife. They failed. Jesus never failed at anything. So that's why my predisposition is to interpret the passages in a way that would agree with that, because I think those passages are clear. Um, how the details work out. Um, let me see if I can... I ran out of time when I was putting this together and I was unable to put... This is the slide that I wanted. So basically... When you talk about uh, eschatology, there have been four basic ways that people have interpreted. Um, historic premillennialism is by far and away uh, the majority opinion of most interpreters. From the time of Irenaeus to the present, uh, most people hold to some kind of premillennialism. Um, a version of historic premillennialism or a development of it is called dispensational premillennialism. Both of these agree that uh, Christ will come back and following Christ coming back, there will be a thousand year reign on earth. The difference between these two views is historic premillennialism believes there will be one coming of Jesus and then that thousand year reign. Dispensationalism believes there are two comings of Jesus. One will be the rapture, which is only for believers, and then a second will uh, be a return. And those are 
um, separated either by three and a half years or seven years of the tribulation. Um, in evangelicalism, um, the vast majority of people hold one of these two views. Um, when I was a student, um, I, um, and you, you know, having sat in these classes for as long as you have, you know I'm a pretty conservative person. Would you grant that, that I take pretty conservative views on most everything? Uh, I don't know any view that I don't take a pretty conservative view on. Um, but I came to the place where I didn't find myself convinced by these two views. 95% or 90% of Christian schools will put one of these elements in their statement of faith, which meant that I couldn't sign it. Brian, however, being an interdenominational school, chose to resist putting this in their statement of faith. And when Brian was looking for a Greek teacher, I had been uh, through the process with so many schools and come to issues like this that I didn't even apply it, Brian. I said, look, I don't hold a uh, premillennial view. Does that exclude me? And the academic dean said, well, no, we don't have, it's not part of our statement of faith. And I said, look, I'm a post-millennialist. Uh, does that exclude me? And he said, no, you should apply. And so when I applied, uh, they uh, offered me the job. Uh, that was 14 years ago. I'm the chairman of the department now. It seems like it's worked out pretty well uh, for, for all of us. Uh, but I so appreciate Brian making space for other views because, I mean, Augustine held this, Athanasius held this, uh, William Jennings Bryan held this. So uh, it was kind of nice that they let me... Uh, uh, teach when the vast majority holds one of these two views. This is the majority view, uh, it, but it's not the total majority. Um, most Presbyterians hold the amillennial view. Um, so if you're in the PCA or something like that, the, this is the majority view. And then only a few people, it seems like, Hold postmillennialism. That happens to be the one that I find uh, uh, most attractive. Um, but as I said, I hold it with an open hand. Um, there are problems. Every single one of these views has major problems. Um, every single one of these views has failed to uh, persuade lots of other people. And so when we get to an issue like this, it's like, let's look at what they all say and, um, uh, you know, settle, be Berean, settle uh, our minds for ourselves. What has persuaded me is exactly what we've gone through in those hopeful passages that Jesus will come and that all the enemies will uh, be um, subjected to him. And then there'll be a thousand years on earth. So I, I subscribe to that view that uh, Christ, that the world, uh, that the lives of Christians are going to become more and more powerful through Christ. And eventually uh, it's going to lead to a, a massive revival where the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters fill the sea. Uh, I hope that happens today. I hope Christ comes back today. Um, there are problems with all views, so I take this, but no, it is the minority view. And basically, these four views really come down to these three issues. Are these passages talking about futurism? That is where the predictions in the New Testament are about events, totally about events that have yet to happen. Very few people take this view, but it is possible. 
most people take some view here that there's preterism and futurism, that part of what the prophecies are talking about are events in the future to them but past to us. Many people see a dual fulfillment that, uh, like Revelation, is about the destruction in 70 AD, but it's also pointing forward to the end of the world. And then um, uh, some see, uh, you know, as exclusively preterism. Um, I fall in this category. Uh, I think a lot of what's happening in Revelation is about the destruction in 70 AD. I'm taking a good bit of what's happening in Daniel 9 uh, is uh, related to uh, Jesus' death. But you've seen from even the good translations that these are very technical issues and they uh, are debated by good people, uh, well-meaning people who are simply trying to put the pieces together. I put the pieces together in a way uh, that agrees with Augustine, Athanasius, B.B. Uh, Warfield, R.C. Sproul, but hey, that's that's a minority view. I want you to be a Berean. I want you to search these things for yourself. And it depends on the passages that we look today and uh, these in the New Testament. The nice thing is uh, when you get into New Testament lit, uh, the teacher will look at these things. So... Uh, We'll, we'll have to leave that for another day. Are there uh, questions or comments uh, about any of the things uh, we've looked at today? Or All right. Well, I hope you have a great uh, break. Uh, make sure that you sign the sheet because I wanted to give you double points today. Uh, so make sure you sign it before you leave, and uh, I'll see you a week from today.